Hello, everyone, and welcome to Capes, Cows, and Masks, the show where we uncover the world of soups and science fiction. I'm your host, Jake Hart. I'm a podcaster, a sound designer, and a writer for the Fresh Take Hub. And as always, I'm joined by my fellow Eternal. <laughs> yes, I am David or Dionysus, which is uh, the Greek god of uh, wine, <laughs> apparently, and uh, ecstasy. So take that, Tom. You know, you're there saying you're the <laughs> sex god or whatever you are. I'm here now to, to take over that, that role. Unfortunately, uh, Tom is the god of illness this week. <laughs> mm, yeah, for a few weeks, actually, he's been the god of he illness. He has. He has been on and off with this illness. So, unfortunately, he's not w- with us on the show today. We wish him he get, uh, well wishes, and I hope he gets better soon. But the show must go on, as they say. And I am very, very excited to talk about this one, Dave. It's got people. Mm. It's got a lot of people talking online. So as you would have guessed, we're going to be talking about Eternals, a spoiler review. We're going to be doing spoilering everything, the story, the themes, performances, all the other stuff we liked about this film. And of course, those post credit scenes right at the end and the future of the MCU. So before we get into the film itself, this is the 26th film entry into the MCU. 26 films, man. It's just absolutely ridiculous now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, This is directed by Chloe Zhao. It is written by Ryan Furpo, Kaz Furpo, Patrick Burley, and Chloe Zhao herself. And the cinematography is also done by Ben Davis, who has worked on other MCU films, including Doctor Strange, Captain Marvel, Guardians of the Galaxy, and Avengers age of ultron so um well let's get into the film then david mm-hmm. you saw the film have you seen it once or twice now i've seen it once once yeah, same here just the one time i do want to go see it again hopefully i can try and catch it in imax but you know knowing all the stuff that going into the film and everything that's happened what were your first reactions coming out of the theater what are your overall thoughts then of this film it it's so hard to say overall thoughts. Uh especially yeah, when I came out, like even like uh, you know, our good friend Steph, you know, messaged me after he uh had saw it and like I was kinda like, Okay, you know, I'll reply to Steph with my first thoughts and I was like, How do I put this kind of thing? It was very much a like, Okay, I get it, I see why it's got the score it has and a lot of it was like, I'm not surprised because there was a lot of those concerns that I had from the trailer. And I don't know, the more I sit on this film, I, I find this a fascinating film, and I think that it's it's got flaws. But to me, I wouldn't say problems. And I th- I say it doesn't have problems, because I think that there's a lot of elements here which are just inescapable. And I think that, you know, when we're talking about different directors and the, the just the entire subject matter and themes and stuff you're dealing with at the end of the day you can't make like a please everybody happy go lucky marvel romp when you're dealing with some of the themes and storylines and characters and source material that you're dealing with so in some ways i came out of him was like that's actually a miracle that that succeeded at all and if anyone, I suppose, was going to do it, it's Marvel. So uh, that's why I don't think that there's any problems because I don't think there's anything that... Mi- like, it goes back to the mediocre reviews thing. I don't think that it's, ne- you know, it's not a bad film. There's nothing like, you know, ultimately terrible about it. There's nothing where you're watching it kind of like Amazing Spider-Man 2 or something in which you're just like, oh, God, this, you know, ruins the entire thing. Or what are you doing? The story's a mess. Da, da, da. There's definitely elements of that. But again, it's not like it doesn't make the entire thing crumble apart. But there's elements of this film that I absolutely loved. There were things that I, you know, really was fascinated by. And it kind of goes down to that comparison I brought up earlier about The Last Jedi. And after thinking about it, I think that I would probably revisit that and say, maybe in terms of people's reactions, we'll see it might be a Last Jedi situation, as we said, give it time. But actually, I think that this is more akin to a Phantom Menace Revenge of the Sith uh comparison for me in terms of you're dealing very much with like a very like stylized film a very like kind of like 
operatic mythic story with like the storyteller and the director has got very much like a tone and a vibe that they want to go for which then sacrifices so many other elements that people would consider vital to make a good film so that's why I kind of like do respect and enjoy a lot of this film because it does kind of like vibe with me in that way and there's like a lot of elements and moments I was thinking back on and I do want to see it again because of like certain visuals and stuff like that. Um, you know, we're going to talk later about the cinematography. And, it, you know, it made me laugh. We were saying before we started that we looked at who the cinematographer is, Ben Davis. And he's done like Doctor Strange, Captain Marvel, Guardians of the Galaxy, Age of Ultron, which like two, maybe three of those films are also Marvel films, which I probably put on a higher pedestal to other people and enjoy because of the stuff that's good about those films while also equally admitting or understanding that it's got like quite a few flaws similar to Captain Marvel and probably Doctor Strange, Age of Ultron, in that I watch this and go like, oh God, this is like why this isn't working. But then at the same time, the next scene comes on. I'm like, oh, I'm absolutely loving this. So it, you know, it, it very much is like a three, three and a half star film for me. But there's definitely elements of storylines which we'll be talking about this, which I just find fascinating and absolutely love. Um, While there's other things which I'm like, yeah, that wasn't pulled off the best. That didn't come across great. They could have done a better job with that. But also, I don't know how they could have, because if you want to have Chloe Zhao, if you want to have like these certain actors and these characters and them to be portrayed in a certain way, I don't know if it's like escapable in that way. I think there was a lot of maybe like easy... Well, not easy, but there was a few things they could have done to, like, amend some of these things. But again, that's why I think it's quite similar to, like, the prequels and stuff like that, is that in some ways you might lose some charm or you might lose what you're trying to go for if you then add other sort of traditional elements onto it. So it's a fascinating film. That's <laughs> that's my consensus. Um, but definitely not without its flaws, um, but definitely a Marvel film I'll probably go back to. Uh, and I just respect it just for, like, not feeling like a Marvel film and seeming like something very different. Um, we'll probably get onto the experience later, but but yeah, that 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 was my thoughts. Nice, nice. Um, yes, very much like you. It's very difficult to put my overall thoughts for this film because first of all, it's a lot of film. Like it's throwing a lot at you, and when I look at this on paper, you know, in anticipation to this film seeing the trailer, it did seem like this is in the makings of one of my favorite Marvel films ever made and could even be my favorite Marvel film. because It just had all the elements that I love about certain cinema. Um, Epic, space, sci-fi, fantasy, gods, you know, big complex themes. You know, it's just got all the ingredients that I eat up when you look at epics like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and Dune and all of that stuff. And, it, you know, with the a director I really admire and respect with a fantastic cast. And I'm just... And watching the film, it's... I'm enjoying it, but there, I'm just like... There's just something about it that's not quite coming together for me do you know what i mean there's certain elements of characters of how the story is told um the the editing and pacing of the film a lot of it if you look at it standalone it's it's magnificent you know but as a film all put together it just doesn't quite work for me in a lot of areas and i feel as if i feel as if chloe zhao's vision i don't want to use the word compromised but i feel as if she was restricted in certain certain elements because it was fitting into the narrative of the larger mcu story i think that slightly hinders this film because i think there's something truly special about this film that if it wasn't within the mcu if chloe zhao could really go full out there with this sci-fi crazy jack kirby story I think it could have been absolutely fantastic. And in this film, there is moments and scenes which I think are a pure brilliance. Some of the best stuff we've seen in the MCU. But there's just other stuff, story-wise and character motivations, that just pull me out of the film and they just let me down and leave me with a lot of question marks. 
Um, I would say there are problems with the film, but there's minor problems with the film. It's not major problems. I, I'm with you. I'm in that three-star territory. There's a lot to love about this film, and I do really appreciate what Chloe Zhao was trying to do um, with the grand scope of things. The cinematographer as well, I really appreciated that even within that, you could see his work's completely different to what he's done before in, in the MCU. Um, with Chloe Zhao's decision to try and shoot on location as much as possible. And I have to say, you can see the difference as well. You can feel these environments um, all over the world. So yeah, there's a lot of this film that I love, but there's a lot of elements that just keep it from from being a uh, the film I wanted it to be. Do you know what I mean? And there is an element, and unlike you... I think the more I think about it, the more disappointed I am for it. And not in the sense of like, this is a bad film, but just like, ah, oh, what it could have been, the potential it had within that film. So th that's more where I'm sort of like, a more disappointment. A lot of stuff I love, but I'm, overall I'm disappointed with what it could have been. Five years ago, Thanos erased half of the population of the universe. But the people of this planet brought everyone back with a snap of a finger. The sudden return of the population provided the necessary energy for the emergence to begin. How long do we have? Seven days. So let's get into the story then. Now, it's a huge story spanning 7,000 years. Um, day one. <laughs> day one. No, I, I, I like the story they were going for here. I liked the, the, the very ambitious take of going for this long span, seeing different times of human history, you know, exploring each of the characters in different um, times as well and see their character journeys. I liked how all that was constructed i had an issue with the pacing and where they decided to, to to put like the flashbacks and stuff like that um it's maybe funnily enough to chloe similar to chloe Zhao, i would have preferred maybe a more of a linear sort of story but that's here or there so yeah the story is grand is epic i like it but funnily enough it's the first half of it the film and this is really weird because a lot of people have said that it falls apart for them in the, in the third act Funnily enough, I struggle more with the first half of the film. I was really struggling to get into it. And then as I was following, because there's also so many characters, I'm sort of getting invested in one character or a couple of characters. And then whoop, we're back over here to see what the other one's doing. And I'm like, ah, but I wanted to spend more time with them. So, And then towards the end of it, I think it really picks itself up with the reveal and all of that sort of stuff. I think it was played quite well. And I think the third act works, like all the action involved. I know some people complaining, oh, more CGI mess. I actually think it works quite well, all the action and the use of the powers. We'll get into the individuals as well. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's a really ambitious story. I like the story. I just feel as if it wasn't executed quite well enough. Um, I think it's the characters that just let it down a bit and the character motivations and the editing as well. I think the editing is really affecting the story personally also the style of like well chloe Zhao's chloe Zhao's style of directing not so much like visual style i think that because she goes very much like with this kind of like natural realistic approach which again works for something like nomadland you feel like it's kind of like a documentary kind of style it and again can work it you know like taika watiti is doing like a very improvised on on the spot kind of comedic style which kind of feels weird and a bit different, but it, you know, kind of works. And at times that it kind of works for this film, but I think it then means that you kind of for like an epic, you know, and for like a Marvel film, you kind of have to be a bit more larger than life and a bit more elaborate about stuff. And because they aren't, you just kind of be like, Oh, you know, like, so I think that 
and there's also, you know, and that's why it's a tug of war that there's, you know, like, oh, you're a god, you're an eternal, you have to be kind of like stoic. And, you know, we were saying about this, I think, you know, when we were saying about the trailer, this is the potential pitfalls you have, because it always happens. Any film about gods and that kind of stuff, you know, you have to be like, I am a god, which then means the audience is, can't relate to them because, you know, there's no emotional connection. I was going to say, that's um, one of the big criticisms people have about the Snyderverse and his take on DC. Yeah, that's why I think that, that com- those comparisons people have been making is correct. I'm like, yeah, that you know that does make sense. Um, also, interesting why Marvel was like, we want some of that. <laughs> like, it, it's funny how they were like, everyone's having a go at us for being a bit too conventional, a bit too like the same, you know, the Marvel humor. So I agree with them that they had to do this. But uh, this is also the backlash that you get on top of that. So it'd be interesting to see where they go forward with it. If they're kind of like, yeah, no, fuck you, we're going to carry on doing this kind of stuff. Or if they're like, oh, we'll go back to the way things were, which I would be disappointed if they did that. Same. I, I'm glad you brought that up because there's also something that I saw online about people saying that they, they hope Marvel don't take the wrong take from all of the discourse. You know what I mean? They like, don't revert to being safer films, you could say keep going with the ambitious type of things as well and on the Snyderverse thing as well Chloe Zhao came out recently and said that she looked towards Man of Steel as a big inspiration for Eternals yeah and in in some ways yeah there was like kind of like Man of Steel vibes going on in this film for me I think that so but for story wise like you you know I I I think, yeah, I had no problems with the third act. I thought, for me, it came together quite a lot more. There's, like, one element which I think is, like, problematic or is flawed, <laughs> as uh, to stay true to what I said earlier. Um, but I, I still appreciate the actual story. Like, one, again, they're, like, the source material, they're, like, yeah, and let's just, like, do this. And you're, like, okay, you know, respect. Um, again, the, the elements of bringing in the different time periods. I also respected... You know, even though there is this element of like, oh, it's a big group of people and is so many characters and storylines, I feel, you know, that they still did do the essentials. You know, so many films in which you're like, what the hell? How could you not even give that person a character arc? They still went like, you know, and this is again why I don't think it's a bad film. They still went, right, everyone has some form of character arc. There's some form of progression. There's some kind of like core or purpose to them, which I think is important and, you know, makes sense that, you know, a director like Chloe Zhao would push for that and put that in there so i i enjoyed that as well and i enjoyed that there was like the pairings of relationships i thought that was good it was a good way of kind of being like okay we can't show you like 10 characters storylines so we'll kind of like couple them up to make it a bit more digestible which i think is quite clever so i enjoyed that i enjoy like the element which is you know true to the kind of greek god you know element of it it's kind of a game of thrones which you know like you've got the music is from uh, the Game of Thrones composer. You've got two actors uh, in here, which are like, you know, the Stark brothers, etc. So there's a Game of Thrones element of like this, like drama of being like, oh no, you know, they betrayed you and all of, you know, he killed this person and, you know, like, oh, the, she's turned on us and that kind of stuff I enjoyed. You know, that is the kind of like medieval drama, the the, the gods and the humans kind of element to it. So I thought that that was really good. Um, I I would maybe disagree in some ways about like some about how the, it's the MCU restrains it in some ways. Yeah, the humor and stuff definitely. But I did at times find that I was like watching it being like, oh, this doesn't feel at all like a Marvel film because there's no like, well, okay, there's reference to like Captain America and Thor and stuff like that. But we don't see, there's no like unnecessary cameos. There's no kind of like walking past the TV and caps on there or something. There's no kind of like, uh, you know, Falcon flying in like he does in Ant-Man, etc. There's no sort of like gratuitous like cameo of just like one of the smaller characters. So I, 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 was more absorbed into the film because I never felt distracted or felt like I was being sold like something. Um, So I enjoyed that element of it. And again, because the visuals of it, I just felt that, like you said, I was watching a film. I don't think I've ever watched a Marvel film. And like, you know, like, I think some people are a bit harsh sometimes that they're like, oh, Marvel films look ugly. You know, I think that, you know, you look at something like Endgame or something like with the shot of Cap at the bottom, you know, with Thanos, that looks awesome. But... I agree with people that because they shoot digitally and stuff like that, there's like no depth of field. There's no like sort of like filmic quality to it. It feels very like 
artificial, very like, you know, like computerized digital streaming quality to it. Um, there's not that depth the film gives you or like with Warner Brothers films, when you get that sort of crispness, the darks. Here, I was getting that, like, as soon as it started there in London, I'm like, oh, my God, there's, like, depth. I can see, you know, like, it's, so I loved that. And, again, the physical ass, you know, the shooting on location probably helped with that. So I think that all of that definitely helped my enjoyment because I'm very much, like, a visual kind of guy as well. You know, I enjoy, like, Tim Burton films and stuff like that. So I enjoy the visual aspects of it. So that probably glazed over some of the story aspects for me. But I think mainly with the story, my main sort of gripe with it is there is the element that it you know like it seemed like Chloe Zhao wanted to tell like a sort of more linear story and yeah the, the flashbacks I think they're timed well enough but they're still distracting and weird um I personally I and I think just even the ordering I think personally I don't know how you would have pulled this off I think one I think the fact that Cersei is like the main character is part of the problem for me in this um, well uh, well the main relationship is Cersei and Icarus, which I felt was the coldest relationship. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, and yeah, that's, you know, like I said, I'll get onto that as well with the performances and the cast. But also just the fact that like, I don't know, was it maybe halfway through this film or something? You had that big moment of where like Druig was so like pissed off and left. And then they were like, oh, we're splitting up and everything like that. What a fantastic scene. That's all great. But I was watching it like, why wasn't this like at the start of the film? Because you're going through this entire film like we need to bring the team back together, get the family together. It's been so long. And I get the element of being like, oh, well, what happened? Why did they break up? And that, you know, that can work sometimes. But you need to sometimes, especially if you're dealing with a group like that, you need to have like right at the beginning, say, um, I don't know what's a good example here. There's plenty of films and stuff like that where you'll have like you're introduced to your cast and stuff like that from the get go. I don't know, something like Toy Story or something. You meet all the toys and then the characters thrown from that world and then you're just with Woody and Buzz and you're like, oh no, I want them to get back, you know, to to their family, etc. And that's always the formula that they go with and that's why it works. So it's kind of weird that they don't sort of set up the characters being like, oh, this is why you love these characters. This is why these are great. This is why they've got all this inner turmoil. Here's the drama that happened. Now, like, jump to the present day. I just found it like a bit of a weird jump to then go, oh, you're in London and this is Cersei and this is her boyfriend and you're kind of supposed to care about them. And I was like, why do I care with them? So I'm with you. I was like more like hit and miss with like the opening half. I was loving the visuals. I was loving the story, the you know, the visual mythic elements to it. But I was still like, oh, you know, I'm not sure about this. I thought it came together better in the third act. But for me, I would have preferred... You know, you can bring in the the flashbacks later on if you want, but I would have just liked that kind of like bigger opening to set the stage. Be like, these are the Eternals. This is the drama. This is the beef that they've got. This is what's happened. And you have to put in there at the beginning that whole kind of like, we can't do anything. This has really pissed us off. And I think that that would set the tone for the rest of the film, especially if you're going to have a storyline later on, which is about, oh, we found out, you know, spoilers now from now on. Um especially later on that they're like oh you know we're not who we thought we are we're being controlled etc if you had set that up right at the beginning of the film it would have like wrapped itself up pretty nicely yeah i was going to make a point by that because um uh, just to make a quick note that droig is probably my favorite eternal because of his storyline and the element that you brought up of him like well why are we not you know they're just killing each other and all of that i'm like i love that so much but like you i was like there just should have been more in the first half of the film of dropping these little seeds of who these characters are and what they think about humanity because we get it very focused on Cersei's point of view, which I understand because she's the main character. But then why in later in the film you're just like, oh, and this storyline, and this storyline, and this storyline, and you're already throwing a lot at us within the first half of the film because you're explaining who these people are. So that's why for me as well, when it cut to London, in fact, I was, I loved the opening scene of them, you know, landing on Earth and fighting the Deviants. I thought, oh, fantastic. Then they played Pink Floyd, right? They played Time and I thought, this is it. This is yeah. it. This is going to be my favorite Marvel film. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the Honestly, vibes. They had me. They had me with that, with the Pink Floyd. I thought, oh, yes. Um, and then it cut to London. I was like, oh, that's jarring. I thought we were going to go back to you know, the, the first scene or, or still early within their time. And 
get like, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes of stuff. I don't know. I felt as if they just needed to be more backstory there. I, I looked to their most recent film, Shang-Chi, and how the opening of that film completely sets up uh, the Mandarin, you know, who he is, what he's capable of, what his motivations are. You set up his relationship, all of these things. Granted, you can't do that with 10 characters in an opening scene, but you can plant little seeds there. So yeah, it felt jarring going from, from there to, to London and then just following her. And then all of a sudden, the deviants are attacking them in London. Um, so I was just a bit like, okay, what's, what's, well, where are we going with this here, sort of? And then once they got to like the first flashback, I was like, okay, I see what we're doing here. Um, there are elements in the story which I did find a bit predictable, though. Um, and I think the main one for me was Ajax's death. Um, the character played by Salma Hayek. Now, for me, because that's meant to be a crucial plot point, do you, do you know what I mean? It's meant to be the big reveal at the end. I kind of saw it coming because even you know, going back to the trailer where the opening of the trailer is Icarus and um, Ajax having that conversation. I'm like, and then we see her there in the barn, you know, dead. I'm like, oh, I think Icarus is killer because he was also throughout the film the odd one out of the Eternals I felt like I granted I think that's meant to be on purpose to have him the most distant the most cold because he is like the Superman character not Superman because Superman I, I push back against the idea that Superman is cold and hard to relate to but with somebody like Icarus I can see that sort of um, I you know I can't iconography with him that's who he is as a character but I don't know. I just didn't feel his chemistry with the other Eternals. It's the evil Superman vibe. It's the, yeah, say. it's the evil Superman. But there wasn't enough for me character development of him throughout the film. So then when the reveal happens and he turns and he's like, no, 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 I'm going to make sure the world blows up. I was a bit like, eh, you know, I don't really care because I haven't really cared about you throughout the film. So the reveal doesn't mean much to me. And I sort of kind of saw it coming in a way. D am I off base or? Did um, you sort of mm, I think because he is that character, like the betrayer sort of person, I think that I don't think it would make sense to kind of like make him sympathetic because then it would just be hard to like hate him in a way or like find him as a villain. So I somewhat. But I don't. I, but he's not. I don't know. I just feel as if they could have done something a bit more interesting there by not making him such a cut and dry villain. Because he's a member of this family, it's a very dysfunctional family. There's a lot of grey within this family. Like you could argue, Drug could be the villain because he's controlling people, but he's not. Like there's an motivations behind what he's doing, and I just felt Icarus's motivations is like, well, that's because we have to, because that's what Arishem commands us to do. Yeah, it's well, a bit weak for me. First, I'll just put a call out to anybody who's listening because, like I said, there's like elements in this which, like, I just keep thinking of i'm like what is this film from and i've been asking you like there is uh, some films out there in which like it has the exact same thing of like you know an order of people who then find out that like oh no our organization is evil and like we've been like commanded by this godly thing which is actually like a monster and we now have to fight back against him please tell me what i'm thinking of because <laughs> i can't think of it for the life of me but this does happen this whole thing of like oh, the perfect soldier person is actually a douchebag, you know, kind of thing. You know, we've seen it in quite a few things, superhero properties. It's like in the Kingsman films a bit, you know, where you find out the like, oh, you know, the guy who runs uh, the Kingsman organization is actually in with uh, Valentine, etc. So we've seen that a lot before. So I think it kind of, for me, I didn't feel like I needed more progression from him because I kind of saw him as, a Homelander kind of character of doing the like, oh, we want to do evil Superman kind of thing. Really? You saw not so, him like not that? As, yeah, but towards the end, definitely. Um, maybe not as psychotic and like evil as Homelander, but definitely, you know, somebody who so like believes in what he thinks, yeah, and single-minded, yeah. which, but this brings me back to my issue, which is then, well, like you said before, like why make that the central like, uh, element of the film or if you are and again this is in something else i'm just agonizing me what it is have it be with a character that then is more traumatized or distraught about like oh my god i was like 
It's in something where somebody's like, oh, I was married to this person or something. It's like, oh, it's so annoying. Maybe it's like get out or something, you know? <laughs> like, it's like, oh my God, my, you know, my girlfriend's a, you know, psycho. But I think that would have like worked wet, better, better. Um, I think that would have worked better if, again, you had like Gemma Chan be like, oh my God, you know, like I was in love with this like monster or something like that, you know, kind of guy or just somebody who like doesn't agree with me. Not so much like go bigger on the evil vibes, but this is what I think could have solved it and I think they kind of needed. And I don't think that Dane is this character. He kind of was somewhat used as it at the beginning of the film, but that's where it turns a bit messy, is you kind of need like an audience's viewpoint you know you always need to have a character which is like you know the the audience's view and to follow you know like captain america is like a good example like he starts off as this like weedy little guy and everyone could be like oh yeah i can relate to him and then he turns into this superhero and you're like yeah good for you man and you know he's doing all these things that people believe in with so at the end of the day no matter whatever happened to cap you know he was you know a, just a kid from brooklyn etc and there was always just that like moral compass to him he never become like the godly characters that these characters are. And I think that that's why we kind of needed like a point of view character. We needed like a human or something, which is like very much like a Saturday morning cartoon thing to do, which is like, oh, the Transformers just have some little boy, like, you know, be like the relatable kid to have there. But you did, you need, because they're so like, Eternals, because they're like gods, you kind of, I think you should have had hey, somebody like... Hey, we had like, Kuran. <laughs> well, he worked for it as well. He was good. Um, but you need somebody to be like, oh, who are these Eternals or something? And then meet them and be like, oh, you know, and let's find it. Let me help you find the Eternals or something. Because I don't think the Cersei, because I, I've looked at the entire list of the Eternals and I'm like, I can't see how any of those would work as the main character. I don't think Cersei works as the main character and I don't think any of them would have, unless you maybe severely changed Sprite. But again, you would have just maybe like, change the character which you know I, I wouldn't have wanted either so i think that they should have maybe just had a character into you which could have been you know the the guide for the audience which could have introduced you to them and then you could still have that like godly otherworldly element to the eternals without like forcing them to be like sort of like relatable or like to to be followed with the audience because i don't think any of them can do that by the very nature of uh the characters and, and, and who they are. Again, same thing for like something like Phantom Menace or something, you know, you, you know, a lot of people complain with that film that there's no sort of like protagonist that you're following during that. Um, and I think that the same is here again, maybe we'll go into it a bit more with the performances and stuff like that. But I think that that for me would have like solved a lot of the flaws here is just if you were able to sort of experience the Eternals through like a, a, a normal person's viewpoint and it would also tie in just the element of, like, we love humans and a bit more of the danger aspect. I think that's the only thing is because you're only dealing with Eternals, you never really get the entire the stakes of what's happening. So, say, Doctor Who is a classic example. You know, you have the companion who goes with the Doctor who's always from Earth. So then when the Earth is threatened by Daleks or whatever, you cut to their family or whatever in a kitchen, like, oh, you know, like, and you'll, you then relate to it more. You understand, like, oh, my God, that could be my family. So when at the end of this film, like, the world's about to end, they don't even, like, cut to, like, anything happening in, like, you know, cities or anything no, like that. No, they're in the remote island. Yeah, 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 so you don't really get a sense of the stakes and about, like, what you could lose and, you know, like, what they see humanity you know, what they could lose in humans as well. Similar again to Mandalorian, you know, Grogu is that kind of like thing of, you know, the innocence, you know, sort of like to sort of ground Mando, etc. I think they could have done that. Yeah, well, I think they were trying to do that with Cersei. Like, I think because she, out of all the Eternals, she was the one that loved humanity so much. Do you know what I mean? She really fell in love with humanity. And I think that's what they were trying to do with her. It worked at times, but other like especially with oh yeah, she's addicted to the phone. You're like, well yeah, we all. Are. <laughs> um, but there was o other moments where I'm just like, you're still there's a big distance there. You're still very unrelatable in a lot Same. of ways. And I think the phone thing didn't. I didn't like that. I just no. thought that was really forced. <laughs> yeah, and then the, another element which there was a lot of telling and not showing in this film as well. Um, a lot of it is needed because it is very exposition heavy. There's a lot of ground to cover. There's a lot of history to cover with the Eternals and Celestials and all of that, how it works. 
But for me, I had a more problem with um, the, the the emotions of the characters. One in particular was um, the love triangle between Cersei, Icarus, and Sprite. Now, I think it's like halfway through the film or, near, or getting towards the end of the third act where it's sort of revealed that it's implied that Sprite has feelings for Icarus and always has had feelings for Icarus and is jealous of Cersei, that sort of thing. Um, and sh- she's explaining that. Um, and I'm just sort of like, well, this has come sort of out of nowhere. I would have preferred, and I think it's better for, for a film, if you have scenes earlier in the film, not even a romantic scene, just something, a little bit of banter, a little bit of relationship building to that way you imply, oh, there's something there between them or you can clearly see that she's in love with this guy. So for me, it didn't quite work that they just sort of threw it in there as well. Is that, oh, you know, I'm sad because I'm always a kid and I can never be with Icarus at that sort of thing. I'm like, I, I see what you're trying to do with this storyline, but there's just, and this is a problem as well I have. I, I, it's a long film. It's already like two hours, and nearly 40 minutes. I felt it could have been longer. I think Mar- Marvel could have even been more ambitious and go, you know what? Here's our three-hour epic. Um, and I've seen some people... Uh, some people have said that this would have been great as like a mini-series, like a six-episode series on, on Disney+. Plus. On one hand, yes, I agree with them because you have a lot more time to tell this big story. On another hand, I'm like, no, man, this needs to be seen on the big screen. <laughs> yeah. So you would I lose think... the epic scale of it, I think. Exactly. So I, I feel as if maybe they could have pushed it to three hours because it is a lot of story. And I feel because of that, I don't know. It's weird because there's some scenes where I'm thinking, well, you could have taken that out and just added something else to build more character. So you could have probably done it in the runtime, but some scenes didn't quite work for me that I feel as if could have been taken out in place for more character building. Yeah, I think um, Kingo says it at one point, doesn't he? He says, you know, you're Tinkerbell, you know, from Peter Pan and stuff like that. And that's, again, where you're, like, being told that. And you're like, oh, that's a great comparison. But maybe, again, they were like, oh, we can't really do this thing because technically she is a child and it would look, like, a bit inappropriate. But because they can't even do the mystique thing of, like, you know, she's putting up this veil and then, like... uh, acting through another body or something because then ultimately <laughs> that is still a child behind that so where's mystique isn't isn't uh underage so you know the, but you had an element of it at the beginning obviously with that guy so like touched her hand and like she was disguised as somebody else but they could have just maybe had something else like that which maybe even if you know she did that with icarus maybe whether she actually like pretended to be Cersei or something and again he didn't have to kiss her or anything because that might have been inappropriate but just something that then like you went oh and then she was like put it down you know put the the mirage down and I was like oh and then you know just something to establish that um and I also think that I at the third act I think the way that she was acting yes even though there was that kind of like frustration from her I didn't feel that they built that up enough I think that because it's kind of like the final closing character arc if you will then they could have, should have really sort of led with that in some ways. It was kind of just thrown in them halfway through and then chucked in at the end. Whereas at least again with Thena, that was kind of like built up throughout the film. Um, and with Cersei and Icarus, that was kind of built up throughout the film. But I actually, like during the third act, and because of the way the sprite was throughout the film, I thought it was going to be she went with Icarus to sort of trick him. I thought that they were like watching that volcano and I thought she was going to put down a mirage of being like, psych, you were watching a mirage or something like that. So when she did actually turn out to be turning on them and be genuinely on his side, I was like, oh, I didn't buy that for a second. I didn't, I did, that came as a surprise to me, not in a good way, because I was just like, that seemed kind of out of character for her. I appreciated that bit where she did lash out and she was like angry about like, you know, what do you think it is like for me? That was good, but I was just like, I would have preferred to have built up to that somewhat, whereas it just kind of came out of nowhere. I I thought, and I thought that if you were going to go down this angle, it would have been a better twist to have the whole, like, oh, actually, I wasn't with you the entire time, Icarus, and I was making a mirage, which made you think that I was with you, etc. Because it would have just added to the team element of the final, like, everyone against Icarus thing. I, I think that would have been better, just have everyone against Icarus rather than, everyone bar just this one eternal is like and maybe another one which 
gets lost, which again we'll get into later. Okay. Um, last little bit then before we go into like the technical side of this film is the so-called villains, the deviants. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Pro. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I crow, yeah, p- voiced by Bill Skarsgård for some reason. <laughs> no idea why, but whatever. Um, yeah, I don't know. I didn't. I f- not quite a waste, but I feel as if they were really underutilized and underused here. Um, they just could have done a lot more with them. With the reveal that it was Arashem who created them all the time, so I was like, so why are we constantly fighting them then? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I, I just d- didn't really quite piece that together. Why they? got out of his control i think that's what he said mm. no i think the idea is meant to be that like you're it's a part of the the balance of the, the yeah the evolution of the planet kind of thing that you do it in an order to kind of build the battery you charge the batteries or whatever you know like i get it but this is where leaning on the technical side of for me the cgi of them at times wasn't great so that they, there were certain sequences where I was like, well, you're clearly not fighting that monster. <laughs> um, so it didn't work for me in that aspect. And then in a story aspect, in this is this is my weak point in the third act where Crow, the main deviant, you know, he's evolved, he's done all this. And, you know, it's all meant to be this big reveal that, oh, it's Arishem behind both of us. We've been puppets in his grand plan sort of thing. And at that moment when he takes Thena into the cave and he's like seducing her, I thought, ah, okay, he's going to make her see or something like that and they're going to team up or something like that. And I felt like you with the the sprite thing to then not do that, to then go, oh, actually, never mind. We're just going to keep fighting you. (laughs) I was a bit like, why? Why? Because it actually amounts to nothing in the end, the fight between Eternals and the Deviants. I felt as if it needed that we're in this together now to defeat the the bigger threat, which is the the birth of this celestial. I also think that it would have made more sense. I, I like, I, I'm not like you. I didn't have a problem with that with them throughout the film so much. I visually, I thought they were quite interesting. I quite liked the they were different animals. They kind of looked like again, if you're going into the mythology, they kind of looked like what you know when you have like the uh, that's in like a film as well. I think it's in um, like Sinbad or something. The um, dreamworks film but like they they're based off like you know what might have been in the stars and that kind of thing like oh look there's the serpent and all that kind of stuff so i thought that there was something like mm, intergalactic but also mythical looking about them i saw like that i liked like when they were in the ice and everything that they were very much like you know he says that they are kind of predators and you know the the element of you know they would just always naturally kind of like hunt stuff um and that they were kind of, yeah, like something that he created, but was out of his control. So he created the Eternals to sort of rein them in. Uh, but they kind of work as kind of like livestock for them to kind of... Cannon fodder. Yeah, to sort of work in that sense. Or just for Arashem anyway, that he can sort of have them as a kind of like, you know, animals for him to be like, yeah, just go chase around these until, you know, you're done with what, what I want you to actually do kind of thing. Um, so... Yeah, I don't have a problem with them in that sense. Uh, I So I think that they work throughout the film to give them something to bat, battle with and sort of distract you from like the potentials of what Icarus could be up to. For me, it distracted me enough. I didn't think like, the same as you. I was a bit like, oh, where does that scene with Ajax and Icarus come in? How is she already dead? Or may, and, and at one point, I did actually think, oh, maybe they have just filmed that scene to throw us off the scent so i i thought that maybe that scene just didn't exist we've had that before which we're like where's that scene and you know like it just you know like they've either filmed it purposely to throw you off or they just recut the film or whatever um so i thought that that was the situation but i thought that they did an, a good an okayish job to make you feel that this is the threat this distracts you but my sort of gripe was at the end it's just like kind of like oh we're all fighting Icarus Icarus is the villain here oh he's too powerful you know like that, that was great but then for like Crow to just walk in like I'm gonna join in too but I'm gonna like fight against you as well even though like he's fighting against you and I'm just gonna kind of be here on the sidelines I'm like this doesn't work like it's like what you know like how can you have like it's not Ant-Man and the Wasp it's not like everyone's there trying to get the suit you know the the building for their own means it's not you know a heist film or something it's <laughs> 
you know, there's like, you know, the good versus bad. This is what this entire scenario is about. And there's no reason for him to be, you know, he's just there like, oh, now I know what's happening. I, I may as well kill you anyway. And you're like, okay. <laughs> so I thought it would made so, so much more sense. You know, you think of something like Aquaman where like Ocean Master goes like, hey, there's this guy who also hates Aquaman because uh, he killed his father. I'm going to recruit this guy. Wouldn't it have made sense for crow and icarus to team up and for like the uh deviants and crow to kind of be like yeah now we know that the whole plan and our purpose we are in you know we bow to the almighty purpose you know etc i thought that that would have made more sense Interesting. um I, 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 I would have done the other way i would have had the deviants working with the other eternals yeah. against arashen or yeah, or that that would have also been nice. I thought that that was another way you could have done it. If you, it's just if you wanted to keep them as the villains, then you could have done it that way. But I thought that yeah, that one would actually be even more refreshing. That would be cool um, to actually have him fight against them. I also didn't see the point in the whole stealing the powers thing. I kind of was like, what was the point in that? You know, like what again? Why did they even have to have him have a human face and everything? Like, oh, I've evolved, and it was like, but why? What you know? What's the point to you? Like, it's not like you know blade runner or anything where they're like oh i'm sentient now you know i'm like growing beyond you know human etc there was just no purpose to that at all um you know maybe if at the end i don't know like he's devolved to he looks like a human and he's like blending in or something that might have made sense but for just to kill him off i just didn't see the point yeah you know it, it meant that they were harder to kill and everything like that but again just to have him then just like die just quite easily at the end when the main villain because it wasn't even like he was there as like the it wasn't even like doomsday or anything in batman v superman it's not like oh this thing has randomly come in and you now have to fight against that it was like the thing you had to fight against was that thing coming out of the ground so and icarus so you just didn't need him there at all so yeah So um, l- let's move on to the, the technical aspects and any other filmmaking stuff that we like. Now, on this front, I have very little criticism, I have to say, Dave, because this film is spectacular to just watch, you know. It's a beautiful film. The cinematography is amazing. As we mentioned, the shooting and location really helps. It gives it that depth. It gives it that relatability uh, that this is our Earth. Do you know what I mean? And the blend, like I said, I, some elements of the CGI of the Deviants I didn't quite enjoy, but I think the blend overall between practical real life locations and visual effects worked quite well overall. And as I said, the action scenes as well, they're really fun. And actually, um, what's the composer's name? Ramin Dawi? Uh, yeah, I was going to say about him actually. Yeah, so uh, Ramin Jal- Dajwadi. Dajwadi, yeah, which has, he's, he's worked with Marvel before. He did the soundtrack, the score for the first Iron Man film. Um, I believe the second one as well. Um, and obviously he's probably most known for his work on Game of Thrones. And, you know, usually I'm quite critical of Marvel, st- of Marvel scores in the sense of like there's not much there to latch on to it sort of at times it just feels like there's a score because we need a score to have in the film there's nothing that there's no big themes that you latch on to apart from i would say alan silvestri's work um ludwig gorison obviously obviously on black panther and michael giacchino michael giacchino not in all his marvel films but in certain films he he does have some really good film uh, themes but overall i just feel it's a bit lacking but this was I need to listen to it again, but this is going to be in the contention of one of my favorite scores in the MCU, up there with Ludwig's for Black Panther, because it's so well constructed. It's very sweeping and elegant in times. 
And then during the action scenes, it's very dramatic and epic, and r you feel the drums and, and, the, and, the, and the brass. It's powerful. So this is up there with one of my favorite scores that the MCU have done. So props to him. But um, anything, what else is that called out to you? Like I know we're probably going to discuss the visuals for a bit. Uh, yeah, I'd also shout out to like Pinar Toprak, who did like the Captain Marvel score, which again has elements of like, you know, generic like Marvel stuff or synth things. But I think she did a good job with like her theme. And I like love the music that plays when she kind of goes supernova and everything like that. So I felt that the score here had some of the vibes of that. And I agree with you. Very sweeping, very epic, you know, like mythical, that kind of like do, 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 do. And I think that they have quite a good theme. So, yeah, I agree with you. I quite liked it. Um, I saw this in IMAX as well, and this did, you know, like, but a lot of the times they were, in IMAX. yeah, they were cut in between, like, you know, the sort of like IMAX ratio for certain action scenes and stuff like that. So when you had that, you were like, oh my god, it looked fantastic, like absolutely amazing, because especially that end scene, that just like, you know, I want to see the film again just for that, because again, that like hand and everything coming out of the earth, and just the the visual of that, like having the, you know, you could see the so curvature cool. of the earth and what's come out of it. That looked spectacular. That was amazing. I just want to interject that. And also, in general, the look of Arashem mm. and the the Celestials, the scale mm. of this film is fucking massive. I loved it. Especially when you had like Ajax or Cersei talking yeah. to me. The teeny little tiny thing. The only thing that bothered me with that is that they were just like floating there. And I was like, are they on anything? And like, I was like, are you like by his like nose or something? I don't know. I kind of would have preferred like a Thanos kind of like they're on a rock and like he's, you know, like above them or something. Like, I don't understand why I they don't know. Kind I, of just I like... felt I, it worked for me. I felt it was more like this very ethereal, cosmic, yeah. like you're not quite in space, you know, you're no. like in this. It also made sense because they weren't physically there. They were like, you know, in their mind or whatever. But I just would have preferred some kind of like, it just seemed like somebody had just photoshopped them just like just standing there. Kind of well, thing. it was green screen. So <laughs> yeah. they were just um, that, standing there with nothing around. No, but you could have like had them like on wires or something like float in there or something. You know, I don't know, something. Put them on a platform, anything. But I just found that a bit strange. Um, but yeah, that looked amazing. When he was telling the story of how he started everything, obviously you get like what you saw before, like, you know, Celestials making the, you know, the universes that all looked amazing. Several points during this, actually, I was watching like, what am I watching? How is this a Marvel film? When it was going very much 2001, you were getting all this crazy visuals, very like Doctor Strange of like going to this crazy, this is the beginning of life, which actually, uh, you know, shame to Tom isn't here. I think he would have like loved this as well, conversation wise, because I was thinking during this, I was like, I'm not sure how this film will go down in like middle America of being like, this is God, you know, you know, <laughs> you know, Jesus, he doesn't exist like this, you know, this Arisham guy, he's actually God. He made, you know, like, I'm like, is, is a Marvel fans going to start like having the book of Arishem or something? <laughs> is it going to be like a little cult following? <laughs> yes. So I found it hilarious that like Marvel was just like, yeah, we're, we're big enough new, now. That's the new Disney plus show, the book of Arishem. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that they're like, we're big enough now that we can start our own religion. And like, yeah, we, we are like a large enough franchise that we can start like the beginnings of mankind and how our, how our world was born and it had nothing to do with God or Jesus or any of that. <laughs> the fact, so that just made me laugh um, that they had the balls to do that, quite frankly. So I don't know how, um, yeah, a lot of like Americans are going to feel about watching this thing being like, mm, well, I, I don't like this, but because um, they very much would outwardly be saying that God doesn't exist, <laughs> which in any of the Marvel film was never in question. Uh, but yeah, I thought that element of the visuals looked absolutely fantastic. Like I said, you know, like you said as well, the visuals. But what I also most loved about it, and this is where it's like very much my vibe. One, the costumes are completely unique, which is good because a lot of people have complained in the past that the Marvel costumes look like it's like the same designer. That it's like the same guy making all the suits that they kind of got the same sort of like, you know, hexagons and, you know, like squares and triangles which kind of makes sense if it's the Avengers, etc. But it does kind of give them like a, a uniformity, which you don't get with something like the Justice League, in which they're all very different looking characters. Wonder Woman to the Flash to Batman all look completely different, which you don't get as much with the Avengers. So here, even though, yes, they do all look uniform, it was a really nice kind of like, oh yeah, they all look like they're 
from the same place. They're, they've all of the same sort of power set. Um, and, you know, we probably mentioned it in the trailers and stuff, but I love that gold aesthetic. I love, like, whoever did come up with that was just genius. If it was Chloe Zhao, or Chloe Zhao, then Chef's Kiss. Like, I just loved how they used that throughout the film, you know, when they, like, suit up and they, like, go in and the gold goes around them. Um, you had uh, Fastos, is it? Like, you know, the way he used his powers, like how, you know, even though a character might not necessarily have a power set that that gold stuff might fit into they found a way of doing it that like you know the gold would sort of like revolve around and it would be like a language almost that would create the mechanics and then like Thena like those action scenes I loved like the way that they used those weapons they just looked amazing like I think you could easily screenshot so many of that and it just looked so cool like when she was facing off against Icarus I was like this is awesome this is the kind of stuff that you want to see from this drama this kind of like I've always wanted to fight you you've always been a dick kind of stuff and the fact that she's able just to like bring up these little like dagger things and then like a pike and a sword it's all the kind of stuff that I love I'm like yeah you know it's not just your normal like oh I have one weapon and it's just you know like a gun you know like you're getting to see really cool sort of fantasy elements so I liked that they kept that aesthetic running through the entire thing. Um, and yeah, just that their costumes caught, so all fitted within that. So I, I really loved that uniformity. And it gave the film a, a style as well, which mel- meant it felt very different to any other Marvel film. That you kind of could see something. So say you were watching, I don't know, Guardians of the Galaxy or something. And say you saw something with that gold or something. You'd be like, oh, it's the Eternals, you know. It feels like they've now got their section of the Marvel Universe just as the cosmic and magic has. Like when you see the little Doctor Strange magic thing, you're like, oh, he's here. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, good point, good point. I never thought about that. But yeah, I would agree with you. I think costume designs are cool. And even though they are very uniform, they still I like that they got the different colors, you know, and in a way those colors kind of reflect the type of character they are in a way. Um, But yeah, that was cool. Um, Speaking of all the costumes and all the Eternals, Let's get into the characters and their performances. Now, look, overall, I think they all pretty much kill it on an individual basis in their performances. Um, Shout out for me, my two favorite Eternals, uh, and it's funny because they're also the pairing together, is Barry Keegan as Droig and uh, Lauren Ridolf as Makari. Um, I don't know, I just really connected to them too, especially... There was even though their sort of relationship came out quite near the end, you're like, oh, these two are a thing. It somehow felt more natural than the other relationships that we'd seen earlier on in the film, it's primarily Cersei and Icarus. I don't know. It just felt really natural for me. The chemistry between them was really good, uh, and in terms of their storylines as well, Grant and Makari didn't really have much of a character arc. She was just sort of there throughout the film. Um, collect, collecting her artifacts, you know, and all the ship and stuff like that. But the way they utilized, first of all, um, the sign language, because Laura Rudolph is obviously deaf. Uh, I really love that they went all in with it. All the other Eternals learned sign language to communicate with Laura Rudolph. I thought that was played really well. Huge, huge props for that. We need more of that in Hollywood blockbusters and, and film in general. And secondly, on a more fun note, is the use of her super speed. Mm, Incredible. Yeah. Honestly, look, look, I am primarily a DC guy. I love Flash, but I'm going to say this right now. This has been the best use of super speed I've seen on film or TV. Incredible. I thought it was fantastic. The way it was utilized, the CGI, um, even her acting within the scenes, like, whoa, you know, and the slow down. Amazing. And when she's doing the super speed and fight Icarus and just not, you know, punching him, incredible. I just was eating that up. I just thought it was incredible. So, and I was even thinking afterwards, I was like, oh boy, the Flash film has got a lot to live up to because that's a whole character, <laughs> a whole film centered around this, the speedster. So that needs to look good. And I just think Marvel have done super speed the best so far. And what I'm impressed about that as well, because I, you know, especially like the going around the world thing, that in itself was like worthy of the IMAX. Because again, you're seeing like, you know, the Great Wall of China and the Eiffel Tower and, you know, the 
statue of christ and stuff that just looked amazing to see her kind it kind of made the world feel tiny and which made sense for her character um but what i think is amazing about it is that you've got quicksilver in x-men days of future past you've got the flash in like the snyder dc films you've got quicksilver in avengers age of ultron you've got uh any other speedsters? We got that we the film? Flash on CW. Yeah, so I think it's amazing that Grant. I, I won't count the Flash from the <laughs> CW because they're <laughs> on a TV budget. But I think it's amazing that all of those speedsters have managed to be different in some way or form as well. The fact that you've had the Flash in Days of Future Past, and it was like, oh, you know, even though everyone went for this kind of like slow down, you know, they can see what's happening. They they all sort of jumped on that bandwagon, but there was still an element of like we need to vary this up. And I thought they did a good job of that, especially considering they were using the exact same character in Age of Ultron with uh, Aaron Taylor-Johnson's Flash. I felt that that was quite different. Quicksilver, to... not Flash. What's... Oh, yeah. Uh, with <laughs> their Quicksilver um, compared to the Quicksilver in the X-Men films, which then was like, okay, Marvel has done Speedster. That's what it looks like. So for them, for the same company to then go, oh, here's another way of looking at it. Which you're like, oh, like, oh my god! So you've thought of another way on top of like three other ways which have done been done previously. So yeah, I I thought it did look fantastic as well. It's unique, which is amazing. Um, and like I said, I don't think of it as like, oh, she's a super speed speedster. You think of it as its, as its own thing, which I think is incredible, and just empowering also to the fact that she is a deaf actress. So it makes the power almost feel like her own as well, which I love. So, yeah, visually that looked amazing, I thought, as well. Other shout-outs, like, for me, um, Angelina Jolie, I thought she was fantastic as Thena. Um, Selma Hayek, she wasn't in it much, but I did like what she was. And I um, hope I said the name right, Ma Dong Siok, who plays Gilgamesh, I thought he was also fantastic as well. So they were my standouts. Uh, but what about you, Dave? What, are you, what were your favorite Eternals? Um... Probably quite similar. Uh, so, yeah, I just, I suppose, where we were talking about uh, Lauren Ridloff there again, you know, we've talked about the visual elements of her character. Um, what I also thought was fantastic about her is that, you know, we saw this kind of like gentle, kind nature to her if you've seen her in uh, The Sound of Metal. Uh, but also here you kind of saw like the playful... Uh, mischievous element of her which she did like incredibly well which was like fantastic um the sign worked really well throughout the film i think they might have said this but you know i if if they haven't then i'm pretty sure that chloe Zhao would have made the entire film subtitled if she could have um but the fact that it was there for those moments in which she was speaking or another character was like translating what she was saying was fantastic and um to go on what you were saying about them and druig it was a part of the film actually wasn't it it came out of nowhere but even kingo said like oh is is anyone else freaked out by this so it worked because they kind of put that into the story is this happening? That it was... please tell me this isn't happening <laughs> yeah exactly so i that that was that was a joke that worked quite well and it fitted in within the whole family aesthetic so yeah i thought that uh she just did a fantastic job and also and the bit and this is the bit the like got me and this is one of the bits where i was like okay i have to love this film just for this like pure moment because i was so invested at this stage is when icarus like threw druid down and she screamed my heart literally ripped in half like i was tearing up because like for one for a person who cannot communicate very much to put out an audible cry like that just it just killed me like one L lauren ridloff give her an oscar just for that scream it was just oh it was so just cut through you it was just horrible and like so emotional i thought she did amazing with that and it's all the heavier because you know that that's not a natural thing that she's doing so loved that that was amazing but also fuck you icarus you are now on my list of characters that i will hate for all time <laughs> for fucking doing this to the character that i was like this is an amazing character you better not kill her off so as soon as he did that to druig and made her do that i was like i will never forgive you icarus i'm glad you threw flew into that fucking sun you bastard so uh yeah <laughs> don't not gonna miss him <laughs> how dare you <laughs> there's a specific list of characters which like 
I was like pissed off at when you do things like that. One of them I can't tell you, uh, but the other one is um, the Night King when he threw that like sword and killed the dragon in Game of Thrones. I was like, right, I'm done with you now. Fuck you, man. You killed the dragon. So Icarus, well done. You've made the list. Uh, <laughs> obviously, as well, I think Brian Tyree Henry uh, did a fantastic job. I loved his like vibe. It's a fantastic thing as well. We were talking earlier about the representation, but what works here as well, and I think that Angelina Jolie said this in an interview, is that they were like, we never made a thing about it. You know, it wasn't like, oh, she's deaf or anything. She was like, well, of course, you know, I think she said that, I think even like one of her kids said it or something like that. They were like, oh, well, yeah, of course she's deaf because people exist in the world who are deaf. And it's the same here. I'm so glad that they didn't have like, if this was made in the early noughties or nineties or something, some character would have said something like, oh my God, he's married to a man or something like that. But they just made it like, this is my husband. This is my child. There was nothing said, you know, like about it. Nobody made a joke. They just naturally accepted it. Um, So I think that he did like a really good job. I would have maybe liked story-wise if they could have just tied in the whole Hiroshima thing a bit better. I thought that maybe there would have been something like he lost somebody during Hiroshima or just just a bit more. This is the thing now, I... Like you, I love how they dealt with the with his relationships and stuff like that. But for me, it was a bit jarring to go from the last we see him is in Hiroshima, where he's like, mm. "Oh my god, I hate humanity! Look yeah. what humanity have done!" But now we see him with in a relationship with a child. What what happened? Like, what, mm. I, I I don't know. I feel as if maybe I wanted little something more, just um, to flesh out that that relationship, basically. I, I think the structure would have helped with that. I think to me, I don't think you necessarily need to see it. I think it's the the element of like, where are they all these years later? Like, oh my God, she's like collecting artifacts. Oh my God, he's doing like, it, it works with the Kingo thing. Like, what the hell? He's like a director, an actor, and you see him there doing the Bollywood thing. It's kind of like that like jarring moment, yeah, of, uh, you know, like, oh, this is what where they are. And like the whole like Nisko find the gang thing. So I think that that made sense to be like, oh, you settled down. What the hell? You know, like, I think that that makes sense. Um, I just would have liked a bit more of the whole, like, oh, my inventions are, like, harming humanity. Like, it would have been nice to see him, like, showing somebody an invention or, I don't know, like, hanging out with Edison or something. Like, just (laughs) some form of, like, showing how his technology was brought in rather than him just literally being in that ship and being like, I'm going to introduce them to this. It's like, can we actually see you introduce them to that? Because when Hiroshima happens, you don't really have that connection of, is he just talking like like in a broad spectrum of like, oh, wow, I shouldn't have introduced them to electricity because this led to this bomb? Or did he literally like introduce them to the elements that made the bomb? It's like, you know, so I thought that that could have been explored a bit more. But I just thought that he was like Druig and uh, Makari. He really worked in the sense of at the end, you really felt that that like family bond and that connection and that opposition to what, Icarus was against worked because he was the one who was like I'm fighting for my family you're a prick I don't like you I never liked you anyway I'm enjoying this and seeing him get to use his powers because at that point you'd only seen him use them like technically for him to use them in a fight setting you're like oh this is awesome like when he's making giant wheels and like throwing them at Icarus and stuff that was really cool and I would like to see more of him as well I think it's such an interesting power set it's not something that we've ever seen before Uh, I thought that that was quite cool. So really enjoyed him, loved his like dry sense of humor. Um, and I think that he managed to pull off some of the jokes, which maybe wouldn't have worked otherwise. Like when he was like scared by the crisp packet and stuff that was maybe saved by the fact that like Brian Tyree Henry was able to like pull, pull that off. So enjoyed him, uh, enjoyed, uh, the guy who played his husband, who I mentioned earlier, who made the tweet also like you enjoyed Barry Keegan, uh, one thing that makes me laugh about this film, and it would have been interesting if they covered it, but I kind of respect them for not, is just the fact that they're like, we're Eternals, we have come here, we are like very well spoken, we are gods, but this guy is Scottish, this guy is Irish, this woman is Hispanic for some reason. <laughs> it's just funny when they're all there like, like, Druig, we must do what is right. And he's like, I'm not going to do it, you are there. <laughs> You're just like, what? He, what? he went very I- Irish at times. Yeah. Like, th- there was times I was like, what, what did he say that? <laughs> yeah, so it was funny that, like, especially when he's next to a thick Scottish accent as well. Like, he didn't hold back on the Scottish either. 
Um, so it just made me laugh. And like American, even with Sprite, I suppose she was quite American. So it, it made me laugh that they didn't kind of like glaze over that or anything. They were like, no, nope. like they just got like full accents and there's no explanation as to why, because they probably would have come from a time in which that accent wouldn't have even existed. <laughs> but oh well, <laughs> that's kind of cool. But he looked awesome. I loved his vibe. I loved what he did at the end again. It was it was nice, the fact that he seemed like a villain and then he was like, actually, no, like you're the dick. I'm going to like help this situation. The moment like where they're all like levitating and stuff like that, like, you know, he like pulls that off as well. Like of, you know, like his costume, I think his is the most cool. That's the one which I was like, I would like to wear that. It looks quite cool. Like with the dark, like red and black, like the whole robe. It's kind of like when they first arrive. I like how you can tell the Zhao and maybe the actors were kind of like, right, this is your moment to give the idea who your character is. So like, uh, Brian Tyree Ca- Henry's character is kind of there, like holding his arm, and you know, like Druig's like holding his hands together. Oh, the, you know, the others. Oh yeah, that's it. Yeah. So I like that element of it. They thought about their like body language and stuff as well. Uh, like you, I thought Angelina Jolie was a big standout as well. I thought that it's interesting that it definitely was like, oh, we've got Angelina Jolie. We need to give her like an emotional, complex storyline. <laughs> I joked when we left the cinema to the person I saw this with of being like Angelina Jolie sat with them like, oh, we're thinking you play Athena, like this awesome like warrior character. And she's like, oh, yeah, cool. Um, is she like screwed up in the head? And they're like, what? And she's like, I, I'll only play her if she's screwed up in the head. I need some emotional weight here. And they're like, OK, <laughs> so but like I th- mad so, weary. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so I was watching it kind of thinking like this just seems like you kind of had to give the crazy emotional stuff to Angelina Jolie because it's Angelina Jolie. But I also liked it at the same time. It was quite interesting, made things liven up. You're like, oh, when she when she going to lose it and all that kind of stuff. Her relationship with Gilgamesh is also one of the stronger relationships within the film as well. And what I really like about it is that it's it's quite an ambiguous relationship in the sense of that I got the like a really a friend just a friendship you know a bit about really really strong friendship and then some other people i follow have said oh they got a romantic relationship between them and i was like interesting i can see why you would see it that way and i like that they deliberately left it ambiguous and like this is just a strong connection and relationship between them the fact that he's like oh no no i'll watch after her so she can keep her memories and all of that yeah i thought they were also a strong pairing yeah yeah, I agree. Like, I I think that, like, in some way, you know, like, there was an element of roman- romance there, but it was almost as if you could see them as kind of a couple, but, like, not acting on their romance, if you know what I mean. Like, they weren't literally there, like, Cersei and Nicholas having sex, you know, there's no other way to say it. Um, like, it's almost as if they had, like, a kind of, like, a non-physical rom- romance, in a way, which kind of is, like, refreshing, I suppose. A spiritual romance. Yeah. Uh I I wasn't as fushed, fushed, <laughs> fussed on Ma Dong Siok's performance. I did kind of see it as maybe like where you get like wrestlers turned actor kind of vibes of being like, uh, I'm not sure if like I'm buying this as like a serious performance. Might have not helped because he was given a lot of the comic relief like when he was in like the baby outfit and stuff like that. But I don't know, it just felt a bit like hammy and staged for me at times. I think maybe it just didn't vibe with Chloe Zhao's style, maybe just the whole like natural approach. Um, so I thought that I liked the story. I liked the part he played in, in the story, but just the performance I thought was a bit like, eh. see, I felt that way about um, Kumail Nanjiani. Mm. There was times where I was like, Oh, right. Your performance is taking me a bit out of the drama, a bit out of the story especially um and i love kuran i thought he i thought mm. he was a great addition he was actually one of the funnier elements i found of the film um but there were times with the with the video recording and stuff like that i was like mm, okay this is getting a bit old now because they kept going back to that joke and i was like can we stop like and it was a bit too cliche it might just be because i've like previously you know been involved with filmmaking but to have him like on the plane like i'm making a documentary it was just like oh, this is like i, a really I feel as if as well because we saw it in shang chi the guy with the phone yeah. and you know, like spider-man does it as well i'm just a bit like i'm a bit tired of that whole like oh i'm making a homemade documentary of my superhero adventures like and i thought that it was actually leading to some ways in like if the eternals were lost at the end that somebody would find this film and be like oh eternals are a thing or something you know i don't know the avengers found where did i put something. the eternals <laughs> yeah. but uh i did like the joke that he kept bringing out the cameras and stuff and he was like you know always be prepared so yeah i enjoyed 
was it uh, Karan? Uh, he he was great. Um, I mainly know him actually because like years ago he was in Coronation Street. <laughs> so that act, and that act has been in quite a few things. I think he's in like Fat Boy uh, Run, Fat Boy Run, and stuff like that. So he's always been quite a so comedic, great actor. So I'm glad to see him get some work in blockbusters. Good for you. Um, but yeah, uh, Kingo. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I wasn't first with Nanjiani's sort of he had a lot of the comedy forced in um so i i wasn't so much opposed to him when they were talking about the more serious elements and when he was saying about like the tinkerbell stuff but i felt that he he just he was lumbered with a lot of the, the comedy that didn't work so don't want to put it so much on camille nanjani he is kind of one of those actors as well because he's a comedic actor whether you just vibe with his style or not um i also wasn't fussed on the idea that like he was just like I'm just going to bow out of the end of the film. And you were like, okay. Yeah, you know, I, I thought it was a bit strange that I, I respected that he was like, I agree a bit with Icarus. I can see why we should do this. I like that. I didn't want him to just also turn against him. But I thought it was just a bit lazy to just be like, right, well, I'm just going to leave. And it was like, could you have at least just stood on the sidelines or something? You know, like, I, I don't know. It just seemed weird that you'd be like, the finale of the film, all the Eternals, which are alive, are here, apart from Kingo, who just left for some reason. So I was a bit like, that seemed a bit weak for me. I, I don't know. I, I didn't like that they did that. I thought they should have tried to find a way to squeeze him in there and do something with that. Um, I think my main problem acting-wise is unfortunately Gemma Chan because it goes down to what we were saying before. I think she just doesn't work as the lead. And I think, I don't know, personally, I've just never really seen the big hype with Gemma Chan. Like, I like her as an actress, and I think that she does certain roles well, etc. But I don't know, I've always found her just a bit, like, wooden at times. And I think that here, because she's playing a kind of, like, godly, eternal character, that didn't help, especially when it's supposed to be your lead character. Um, and that's where, like, the whole kind of, like, big moment of the film kind of fell flat for me. I, I loved it for the visual element and what they were doing and what it meant for the story and the lore. And, like, I loved her power set. I thought that it was really interesting powers. I liked when, like, that rock fell and it was going to hit the girl and she turned it to sand. You were immediately like, oh, I understand how this power works. That was something different. The way that they used it, like, in the woods when she chopped the tree down and made it metal. But there was other elements which I thought in the choreography and like you said, the editing, which didn't work. When she was like, oh, there's a deviant here and she's just like running away and she's like, he, he's over there. And then there's like people running and then she's like, over, over here. And I'm like, what? Uh, I don't know. It just seemed weird that like she was almost one of the like active warrior members of the Eternals. But then she was just like a lot of the times just flailing around the place, running around. When I'm like, well, you did the thing with the tree and turned it to metal. You've sunk them into the ground. I just... I was like, I don't understand why you just didn't make her fully like a fast or so character. Like, I stand away. I don't get involved in the action. When I do, I like am epic or made her very much like at the forefront, like Makari jumping in there. I just, or at least just don't cut to it. Just stop having her running around flailing about. No, I'm with you because the 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 main thing I had throughout this film with uh, Cersei, I was just like, can you make a fucking decision? Yeah. Like, just <laughs> do something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And then finally, at the end, when she decided, I was like, finally, yeah. at the end of the film, <laughs> yeah. you've decided to make a decision. Like, and Yeah, I felt that as well. Just flapping about, not really, uh, come on, give me something. Like, Yeah, and so that's on the script, the direction, but also just the performance. I felt that she was just never really selling me as like, I am the main character. I've got all these emotions. I've got all these feelings. Like... The Arashem stuff is really powerful and it's really interesting. We were talking about it the other day, the moral complexities of like, you know, should you let the earth be destroyed and should you like go against the grain, all of this kind of stuff. But I didn't really feel that she was holding the weight of that enough. I didn't really feel that she was like, I'm really strongly opposed to this. I just felt that she was like, oh, and then she's like, yeah, we're being like manipulated. I don't agree with it. And they're like, oh, you know, like okay, we I should felt do that, something about that. Yeah, <laughs> their, their reactions were stronger than hers. And I just... I just felt that she was a bit flat sometimes. And again, I don't know if that's just because she's playing the kind of like, oh, I'm like an ethereal, like Galadriel goddess type character. Like I'm, yeah, but I'm they an all ancient are. being. Yeah, 
but at least with Ty- Brian Tyree Henry still brought some form of personality and humanity there. So that's well, what makes that's, me think. That's what I mean. She's got no excuse because they all are. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. And they all brought a bit of, well, most of them brought a bit of character to them. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, yeah, that was the one performance which I thought, to me, stood out the most, mainly because she is the main character. Cut! Okay, everyone, that was good. I think we can do 10% better. That was beautiful. Very, very good. Ah! <laughs> My friends from college are here. Oh, sure. Oh, boss! Perfect timing. Welcome to the set of Shandar Dastane Icarus. I'm playing you. You like the costume? We need to talk. Tell the director I have some notes for him. We need to talk to you in private. Oh, Karan, he's worked with me for 50 years. I trust him completely. Actually, when we first met, he thought I was a vampire, and he tried to stake me through the heart. I have apologized so many times. Not quite enough times. Very close, though. I'll let you know. Oh, I have to get ready for the next scene. Come to my tent. We'll talk there. Right, let's move on to the post-credit scenes because there's two. There's a mid-credit scene and a post-credit scene and boy, Dave, they're two big ones, I gotta say. Um, unfortunately, the mid-credit scene, I was that was the thing that I was spoiled on a um, few a couple of weeks before Eternals came out. Shame on you, HMV. On to the actual scene itself. So we have Droig, Makari, and is it just them two? Or is it there uh, someone Thena's else? there as well. Thena's there as well. And they're off traveling in space, you know, doing whatever. And then they get a visitor. And that is Harry Styles. Hello. Well, no, they, uh, Pip <laughs> first. Pip the troll. <laughs> Played by, by Patton Oswald. Oswald. <laughs> um, oh, oh I, I, I'm sorry, Dave, but I, uh, Pip looked fucking horrendous. It looked <laughs> like a PlayStation 2 character. Honestly, the CGI, awful. I, I'm sorry. I just thought it looked dreadful. But that's not what was exciting. What was exciting is he introduced Eros, also known as Star Fox, who will be played by Harry Styles. Nothing crazy, just a cute little introduction scene saying, hey, look who's in the MCU. Um, I've got to say, he looks great. The costume looks awesome. And I'm excited to see where he pops up next. Um, What did you think of this reveal then? Obviously, you were already spoiled by it. Yeah, Uh, it very much was a kind of like, oh, look, Harry Styles is in the MCU. And um, I did hear some girls like giggling and screaming uh, in my viewing. So I suppose it works in that sense. Um, So I was a bit like, uh, I don't know, it's a bit like on the nose because especially like Disney seems to have been circling Harry Styles for a while because there was like rumors he was going to be like in the Little Mermaid uh, remake. So at first I was a bit like, uh, it's a bit like on the nose, isn't it? And like, it's a bit like, you know, who's going to show up next? Like, oh, look, this person's now in a Marvel character. Like, you know, the the Oprah meme, like you get a character, you get a character. Uh, but when I read Chloe Zhao's like reasoning for why she wanted him and why she thought it was good for the character, I was a bit like, okay, I can see this now. I'm a bit more on board. Uh I still am not fussed with the whole idea of, like, brother of Thanos, the guy who looks nothing at all like Thanos. Yeah, you're going to have to... I mean, in the comics, it can work because yeah. comics, but yeah. you're going to have some serious explaining to do. <laughs> yeah, it, and it's just very much in a film. Like, in a comic, you can get away with, like, he's the brother of Thanos. It's just in some box or something. Whereas, like, in a film, when you say, like, brother of Thanos, and it's just like, oh, uh, like, you're still peddling this Thanos thing, and, like, our audience will understand who he is because he's brother of Thanos, and it's just like, okay. Yeah, we thought um, we were done with Thanos, yeah. Yeah, so, but I think that he looks good. He still fits the vibe of Eternals. I think that, like, you know, he's got, like, the same sort of costume, so you're like, oh, okay, you know, we're still within this, like, you know, corner of the MCU, as I'm saying, with, like, you know, the gods and everything like that. I think it's cool that they're like, oh, we're look at, going to look for more Eternals. So then it makes sense that he's like, well, hey, you know, I'm, you know, essentially an Eternal, so uh, I can help you out. So I think that that's cool. And I think what Chloe Zhao said is that she wanted to go for a very much a like David Bowie kind of vibe of like, you know, he's kind of like this sex appeal and like this kind of like young, hip trendsetter guy, you know, which is kind of like, feels like, the fact that he's very like sort of gender fluid in like his performance and like the persona he puts on. So very much like again, like David Bowie of that persona he put on. What was it called? Like Ziggy Stardust, Ziggy Stardust or something. Yeah. yeah. So like because Harry Styles has kind of taken on that persona as well. Uh, or his own persona. 
of the way he goes on stage and his fashion choices and stuff like that. I was like, okay, you know, again, it's like Guardians and stuff like that where they're doing this like very like odd, you know, like kind of like on the nose kind of like character performance, um, which is based on either the person who's playing them or this like based on somebody within pop culture. So I was like, okay, I can be excited for that. That seems quite a good choice and it makes sense to to cast him in that sense and also a lot of people are just like what the hell why is this pop star in this film and you know as you said like he is an actor he has been an actor and as i said as, to you as well you know will smith anyone you know like plenty of singers have turned into actors that's just a thing uh jared leto you know another example so people uh, just need to i mean he's worked with chris nolan chris nolan's not going to just pick anyone do you know what no. i mean like so yeah, I, I agree with you. I thought that the CGI looked a bit dodgy with Pip and I was a bit like, oh, you know, like I was <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, oh no, what are we in for here? And uh but I'm so much of a Patton Oswald fan, it's hard for me to completely hate it, and I have been waiting for him to come into the MCU. Not sure if this is the role I would have liked him in, but okay, whatever. Um They should have just brought Modoc into the MCU. <laughs> yeah, well or his character in Agents of Shield, which is just some boring like Shield agent. So he's been in there a few times, I guess. Uh I personally would have just gone for his character in parks and rec in which he just comes in and filibusters about the future of the mcu or something right let's move to the post credit scene then which is uh, dane whitman <laughs> he's back um after we found he's like oh he's got this nice new uh, ring and he's like oh i've got a troubled history part you know his family history we see him there he's opening the sword the sword of oh i had the name of it uh the ebony blade the ebony blade that's it and then he's hearing whispers as he's about to reach it. And then he hears from the corner of the room. I actually forgot what he said. What he said. <laughs> um, I was in suspense then. I was like. <gasps> he says, uh, like, Dane Whitman, don't pick up that sword or something like that. It's like, oh, I thought it was like. You oh, no, no. He, he, he says, you don't want to pick that blade up, Dane. Mm. And that is the voice of Mahershala Ali, confirmed by oh. Chloe Zhao, Has it voicing now? the character of Blade. I've seen a few things speculating as to who it is, but I think I was waiting until our review to watch that kind of speculation. So, Confirmed uh. by the director herself. That is Mahershala Ali. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Has he had a tie with Blade in the past? or? Um, my sort of comics knowledge of the Black Knight is ve- is very minus. I don't know much about him, but it does seem to fit within that world yeah. of magic and ooh, like go- like spooky oh, stuff and all that. Sort yeah, of- we've said before that they kind of want to maybe establish a kind of like yeah. horror, dark fantasy element of the MCU because yeah, I fact- I'm in favor of having the magic Doctor Strange stuff be separate, um, not like linked. And I, th- I think this would fit together. And this, it, it just leads me to believe as well that Blade is a lot sooner than we think it's going to be. Mm, I have true. a funny feeling now, cause especially with the rumors of Blade popping up in the Moon Knight series. The main thing I'm concerned about is like setting up all these different like factions and worlds, even though I'm excited for it and I think it makes sense. And I'm like, oh yeah, the Eternals, it makes sense to have this like, you know, the sort of, gods eternals corner of the mcu they've got their own aesthetic as i said but the only thing i felt with this end cred these two end credit scenes was there was kind of like also going like oh and here's two other sort of like avenues in which it's like eternals in space which could potentially be guardians and you know like love and thunder and also like oh and also this medieval stuff as well so i was a bit like uh you know like i thought it was like a a bit much like thrown in whereas like i feel like some of my favorite like end credit scenes sometimes when it's kind of like more of a natural progression of what you've seen uh in the film like say even something like winter soldier even though you went to like quicksilver and scarlet witch it kind of still was like okay you know like the hydra and all of that kind of stuff um you know the idea that shield was up to like no good all that kind of stuff when you've seen it then you're like oh there's experimentation here i just 
even though it was related, I just felt it was going off a bit too in random tangents. But I guess that's because they did kind of wrap up the story a lot. So then they were like, oh, we have to do like three big cliffhangery kind of endings. Who cares, Dave? We got Blade. <laughs> yes. <laughs> got Blade. I'm excited for Blade. I think it's more just the Black Knight. I just don't really see the appeal of that character. Looking at his history and like it'd, his it'd appeal. It'd be interesting because he's also like, he becomes a villain. At one point. Mm. So I wonder if they're going to do that with ki- with this version of the Black Knight. Maybe have it as an anti-hero. Yeah. Maybe going towards villain. We d- I don't know. But Apparently, because... yeah. The blade is supposed to be there. Every time you use it or draw blood, it like it's like a curse. So like it makes you like turn more evil. Or, like uh, like you lose your mind more. So kind of like, you know, the Thena kind of thing. Of, like, you know, they, they're broken a bit. So, uh, yeah. I think it is interesting. But I just don't know. I'm like, can I really see like king arthur essentially running around with the <laughs> avengers because it's not like his he hasn't got he a power like, really he, he doesn't necessarily have to mingle with the avengers dave no he has a previous he has been in the avengers in the comics though but i'm just a bit like to g- general audiences are they a bit too like like the person i saw it with was also a bit like oh thena oh they're not are, are they proper is the marvel universe now going into like all the gods are we going to start seeing poseidon and stuff like that and I was like, oh, n- not quite. But then you are like, well, there's Hercules and stuff. But also the fact, so with this, I'm a bit like, will people be a bit like, oh, you know, really? Are we now doing King Arthur? And, you know, like, so I'm excited, like you say, for the potential link in with Blade and everything. And that kind of corner would make sense. But the fact that we are getting like Moon Knight and all this kind of stuff, I just hope that they're not kind of spreading themselves too thin and having all these different factions, especially with kind of C, D list characters to me, like, Black Knight, I was like, I wouldn't be, like, on my priority list of being, like, we need to set up Black Knight. Like, I, people were like, oh, Dane Whitman is Black Knight. And I was kind of like, I hope, because we've got such a big cast and so many heroes, I was hoping they would have been a bit more subtle in this film, that they were like, this is Dane Whitman, and that's it. And, like, you're planting the seed as they've done in previous films, but you're not actually, like, kind of like, uh, well, no, you can't say it with Rhodey, because he literally says the line, next time, baby. What's a character which they had, which is like in they become a character, like a bigger character, but they've literally been built up in the films, like in a smaller role. What do you mean? Like you've seen them as just like a normal person and then they become the hero or villain or something like two Um, films later. Pepper Potts. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, she has that moment at the end. Yeah, game, I guess. Um, so i want to see luis get his moment to shine (laughs) (laughs) yeah i just would have preferred yeah like just more of a a, a slow build up to that of just the whole like oh did you know that was black knight you know like he's going to be a hero in the future not so much like in the same film you know like when we're meeting like 10 other characters and harry styles and everything else but learning the blade thing that does make it cooler so very excited very excited (laughs) we're eternals We came here 7,000 years ago to protect humans from the deviants. Why didn't you guys help fight Thanos or any war or all the other terrible things throughout history? We were instructed not to interfere in any human conflicts unless deviants are involved. By who? That is our review. Dave, any closing thoughts on this film? Very much like the overall thoughts, if you can Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, confine it into a a final statement about this film. And on what you said earlier, do you recommend people to see this film? Um, I would definitely like, I would definitely recommend it to like comic book fans. And, you know, we know at this stage that that's still enough to bring in five, six, seven hundred million uh, at the box office anyway uh so yeah i you know i i definitely recommend it how much i can recommend it to just like your average movie goer you know it very much depends on your taste and what you enjoy but personally you know i have a lot that i enjoy with this film as we mentioned there's just a lot of like flaws and stuff that could have been tinkered with just to make it better but as i said at the top i don't think it's a bad film uh there's loads to love 
as we mentioned, just things like the visuals with characters like Makari, the performances, the representation that they're achieving, the fact that, as you mentioned, this story spanning over seven years, the fact that they had the balls to just be like, we're creating our own religion, and this is the the birth of like the, the universe in, in the MCU. You know, it is all admirable, and the fact that you do have like a creative ambitious filmmaker like Chloe Zhao doing it I think does add something special to it which you would have lost had you just replaced her and put in like a generic director uh I do think that then that does lead to like some of the problems with the humor and stuff like that but I think that's what is interesting about this film I think they can easily have a fan base and can easily be one of those films people can be like you know what I really enjoy this film or I love this film because I can understand the flaws but I just love this stuff so much. This is why I like it, which is what a lot of people's relationships with, are with a lot of films, you know, like Hook or even like Birds of Prey or, you know, Batman v Superman. There's people who will like maybe understand the flaws or will just overlook them because of what they love so much about it. So, and I think that that could easily be this film for loads of people. Like I was coming out of the cinema and I was still a bit like, oh, I don't know how people felt about that one. Um, and there's like a few sort of like, it wasn't like end game. I didn't feel like there was like this big buzz after it, but there was a group, few group of people who weren't like the kind of crowd I saw usually at those films, which were like really excited about it and loving it. And I was like, that's good. You know, like it's attracting different types of audiences and different fans as well. So yeah, for me, it, I, I wouldn't put this at the bottom of my MCU pile. I've said in the past, I'm a big fan of like Captain Marvel and stuff like that. So it'd be like maybe like a middle-ish MCU film. But there's definitely some stuff that I would have changed. Um, but I still think for overall it's it's quite a cool and epic chapter and corner of the MCU. You know what, Dave? Sometimes you just take the words right out of my mouth. Um, no, you said that very beautifully. I don't really know what to add to that. Like, I feel very similar to you in the sense of that this is a very grand, ambitious, epic film. And for that, I love it and I appreciate it. I just find there's just something, the execution of it, there was just the glue missing to bring it all together for me, for me to go, wow, what an amazing film. So for me, it is, it's a good film. I enjoy it and I'll happily watch it again and I am really excited to see it again in IMAX. Um, But it is a very mid-tier, towards the lower end mid-tier uh, of in the MCU for me, unfortunately. But there is a lot to love for this film. And like you, I do think this is going to be uh, one of the most culty MCU films. In a sense, like the perfect examples you had, like Batman v Superman um, or Blade Runner, with those films that, that initially when they come out, people are like, whoa, what is this? There's a, it's so different and weird. And then over time, people sit on it and they go, mm, you know what, actually... This is fucking amazing. <laughs> um, so I think it truly will be one of those films. Whether or not it does that for me, we'll see. Um, but there's still a lot to love about it. And I just hope Marvel looks at this and goes, yeah, that didn't work for everybody, but it was never going to work for everybody. And that was the point. So that and we're going to keep trying to make ambitious, weirder films, you know, a bit more out there films, not formulaic as they have done before. So I And you got you got Disney Plus to do that kind of stuff as well. Now. Exactly. So, you know, the world's your oyster, I say, with the MCU. And I think with going on, the, the MCU spraying themselves a bit too thin now with the amount of projects they've got going on. I think this is a good way, though, of you can have as many projects as you want going on. But with the factions, you can go, OK, I'm just going to chill in this corner of the MCU. I don't have to watch all of it. I, I like the sci-fi stuff. You know what I mean? And I think they can, they can now build upon that. Like Star Wars, in a way, you've got your bounty hunters or, you, you know, you've got your war stuff or you've got your Jedi stuff. You know what I mean? I think you can do that with Marvel now. Um, and I think this is a good starting point for them, and I hope they continue to do this. So, yeah, for any comic book fan, go see this. Go see this in the biggest screen possible. But for your average moviegoer, yeah, it really does depend on your tastes. Um, but then again... Art is subjective. You just don't know, do you? I recommend most films to people because I'm like, I don't know, you might like it. <laughs> yeah. So, who knows? Yeah. Film is all about, you know, you like it, you dislike it. You know, like I said, it's, it's similar to me. Yeah, like you like, you might like it, and but if you don't like it, 
th- th- then you are all the better for that experience to understand why you, you didn't like it. <laughs> and I always think as well, you're always, even if you dislike a film, I always think you've, you'll find some more enjoyment out of it by watching it in a cinema. That's just me. But I, there's a different experience. Like if I watch a bad film on like a streaming service first rather than a cinema, I hate it even more. <laughs> mm. And also I think that this is worth comparing to say something like Wonder Woman 84. And I hope that people don't have the same reaction to, to this as they did with that because that's equally a film which I can understand the flaws with. But there's a lot of elements that I like really like about it. And I think to me this film is maybe better than Wonder Woman 84. But I hate with a passion that approach which so many people have, mainly males, of, yeah, but Wonder Woman 84 was trash. Wonder Woman 84 was the worst film I've ever seen. Wonder Woman 84 was ab- abysmal. It's like, one, you can't be saying about like how great like female directors are within the superhero genre and say the Wonder Woman was great and then diss a film by the same director who had more creative control over a project. That just undermines your argument. But two, just nothing is like, it is trash. It is garbage or anything like that. As we were saying, people have different tastes. They might enjoy it. They can overlook the flaws and stuff like that. There's nothing about like Wonder Woman, which, you know, like I said, we're talking about things like Catwoman, Last Airbender and stuff like that, which you say like, this is actual rubbish. You know, like they didn't make any effort with this kind of thing. I think that that's what's like the most disrespectful. So I hope that doesn't come from this film. So therefore, please go see it to like block that hate. Similar with Captain Marvel, I think that there was enough people saying like, fuck you, we don't want to listen to you. Go back in your corner and cry. Those man babies, Dave. Those, those <laughs> Yeah, they're back. <laughs> the man babies, they're back. <laughs> right then, um, we'll be back next week. But before we go away, Dave, where can people find you and what are you getting up to as we end this episode? Uh, you can catch me over on Twitter where I'm also like sharing a lot of the good vibes from Eternals and some of the stuff that I enjoyed in it. Uh, you can catch me over on Letterbox as well uh, where I'm keeping track of like the cinema releases I'm seeing, still hoping to get back to getting some normality back once everything is set up and uh, routinely in place uh, for all the projects and moves and everything like that. So hopefully I get to catch up on some more films come like the new year, Christmas time. So catch me on there, see what I've been watching and reviewing. Uh, also keep an eye on socials and fresh take. Uh, Cause I have an article, which I wrote uh, a long time ago now, which has never been online, uh, which is perfectly timed for this because it's talking about uh, representation in film and television for people with, invisible disabilities so that'll be going up on my website and on freshtake.com uh talking all about how people who might have like autism who might be blind who might be deaf how they feel underrepresented in uh film and television how it's important to get characters like makari who reflect them so that you can get a wider understanding of the world and also you're giving opportunities to those people who are disabled themselves um, and not giving it to somebody who is, you know, a typical, you know, person in terms of like, you know, if you have a deaf character and it's played by somebody who is not deaf, you know, like it's talking about the importance of people of those backgrounds playing those parts. So, you know, on that one and, you know, my final thoughts on this, I would just like to touch on something I bring up in that, which links into this, which is Greta Thunberg, who uh, herself uh, has Asperger's syndrome and has said without her Asperger's she would have never been the climate uh, change activist that she is because she is you know the hyper fixation on the climate is what has made her so passionate about it so she sees that as her superpower so uh, I would encourage everyone to see you know these so-called disabilities as those people's superpowers which I think Lauren Ridloff and you know as Macari perfectly represents so Let's all champion our superheroes of the world, like Greta Thunberg, like Makari. You hear that, ladies and gentlemen? That's a fucking rider right there. <laughs> that was beautiful, Dave. Very well said, very well said. Um, 
Fucking hell, you've left me with quite the, the thing to <laughs> follow up on. There's a tear down Jake's eye right I'm now. Just gonna, <laughs> I'm just going to casually, you can follow me on Twitter, <laughs> at Sweaty Jake, <laughs> and you can also follow me on Letterbox at Jake Hart. Um, as for the show, you can find and follow us on Twitter and Facebook, or should we call it Meta now? I don't know, at Capes, Cows, Masks. And whether you use Anchor, Spotify, Google, or Apple, subscribe and follow us on there. And if you're on Apple, leave us a rating and a review as it all helps us go up in the ranking. So thank you all for listening. We'll see you all next week. Stay safe, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye.